students to um, develop a better low range in the F tuba. Of course, the C tuba is kind of a more kind instrument, but if you play B flat, this exercise will be help you also to work on the low range. Yeah, um, we normally in, in my studio do it like uh, in fifth. Yeah, like now we you can start also in F major and go into F and so on all the time, changing different fifths in different parts of of the range, so that you you know train different feelings because it's not the same from the volume in the low range than in the middle or high range. Yeah, um, good. The next one um, is an uh, an exercise that I used to do uh, flexibility through uh, over notes. So each of us are going to play in the key from our instrument and we are going to play <clears throat> I play one more time it is I think it is easier than try to explain the exercise and if you have any questions you just raise your hand and ask very easy Clear for everyone? Great, let's do it. Everyone in, in, in their key, and uh, I'm going to put the metronome so that we have a measure, and don't forget to breathe before you, we start, yeah? What, what I say, don't forget to breathe before we start. I give you four beats to breathe, and we do it together. We are going back, okay? Okay? No, no, really. uh, no well, in, in this case, because I'm playing F2, what do you play? A C? Oh, I can't tell where I'm at. 
Ah, don't worry. Uh, you play on the on the e f uh, on the B flat over notes always. B flat F, B flat B flat F, B flat D, and we go down each on because we we cannot match it. We, we every, 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 when we work on over notes, we need to use the key from our instrument. Don't worry, it's fine. We can repeat it if you like. But I what what I like <clears throat> from this exercise and when I do it in a crowd of of human tour players is I I. Stop torching and ask metronome. So, is that um, it is for me very interesting to see how a Fuji Mantua player stop breathing be between exercises, which is a huge mistake because we need the air into our lungs to use it to play, first thing. And the second is um, normally when we practice, we practice very in a kind of shortly way. We don't go normally into the whole range. And what, what I like to do with these exercises, or, or with all of exercise, what I do for, for basics, is try to extend it as much as I can. Yeah, because you have listened, we start and the sound was there from everyone, and it was sounding bright, and we, we all, I could listen to everyone, but as, as, as far as we go lower, we start losing sound, yeah, and kind of people. <laughs> and we need to try to keep the same, um, um, of course, um, amount of a sound. And that is, with, for example, with this exercise, is going to uh, mean that we need to use more volume of air because as we go getting lower and using more valve, we are extended the length of the instrument into the maximum. That means we need this volume of air going into the instrument. We need to breathe before. And that is for me very interesting because worldwide that happens all the time. I do a master class, I, I talk a, a one hour about breathing and we do exercises and I force them to breathe. And as soon as they go through the door, they forget everything. It's magic. Yeah? But I think it is very important to repeat ourselves all the time when we are in the practice room. Just breathe before you do whatever you want to do. It is very important because the body, the lung, is a muscle. And this muscle needs flexibility. And we need to train it if we want to have this flexibility. If we don't do that, then it's not going to work. And the other thing what I have uh, seen today a lot is you breathe very high, like here. Yeah? But the main problem with that is that you are losing two-thirds of your breathing capacity. Because here, over the lung, there are the ribs who are protecting the lung. And it's a limit, a physical limit. It's like <sighs> finito. Yeah? But if you start from the bottom of the lung, then you have the possibility to breathe like this and feel it completely. And I think that is very important for us. And this skill is not coming for, from just trying today. This skill, you need to sit down and train it over a month so that you ha the, the, the body and the air and the lung knows where they need to go and how they need to work. Yeah? And I, I see a lot of you breathing like, and that's it. And that is too less air for our instruments, for any brass instrument, in my opinion. But for our ins instrument, for sure, because we work a lot of volume, for sure, in the low range. Yeah. So try to think here. I know it is tough, because at the beginning, we kind of think, oh, yeah, I can breathe a lot down. And we do this, yeah? But it should start here and keep here two thirds and then at the end here. It looks like a little like this. And when it's full down, I go up. And then I have the third third. But I have a lot of aid that I can use to play and to do whatever I want. And again, I know that. Uh, we talk about a lot about air in the in the well, Fonio Mantuba community, but the key is for me to give you something where if you are not doing that you have, can work in the next month. And I think this lower bottom breathing that is very important for us. Okay, 
So do you want to do the exercise? Because the idea for the exercise is going down into the end and then going up. Do you want to do it one more time but complete? Or we should do another one? You, you feel free. Okay. So we start down there. You know where we know. That is going to be tough. But we can try. We can try. Let's see how many notes. Um, So we start um, for F2 it will be a, a F sharp or C flat. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to translate to B flat. Wait, or C. Um. No, it's fine. Don't worry. Don't worry. We can count. Listen. Go 12 not low. Be natural. There we go. Thank you very much. So be natural for B flat and um, G uh, uh, flat for F and will be for C, C, D flat or C sharp. Yeah. Thank you very much. We start there. Yeah. I put the, our friend the metronome. We breathe first. Okay, don't forget, brief is the key before we do whatever we want to play. Yeah, it is fast, long note, because using air help us with a lot of things, intonation, sound quality, don't press against the instrument, holding notes, getting high and low. It is for everything yeah that is that is the main key of course we need to do other things right too just with air doesn't work if the embouchure don't help yeah but it's important that air is a major you know 
thing before we start. So now we are going to do an exercise that I developed for myself uh, um, when I was studying in Germany, uh, because what I have been doing was like cowing. How, how do you say when, when, you, when you eat? Chewing. Ah, oh, chewing, not cowing. Oh, sorry. That was a, a word between German and, and English, sorry. Chewing uh, for articulating. And that have uh, made me very slow uh, with the articulation, and I couldn't find any solution. So I developed an exercise which is actually in very easy in the form. We are going to play a whole note, and then we are going to play first just four quarters. And in between the whole note and the four quarters, we are not going to breathe again, and we are going to just keep the airflow steady and move the tongue just inside the mouth so that in the outside the muscles stay on the same way. I do it one time. First breathe. It took me a while but these exercises help me to understand that articulation have nothing to do with the outside muscles of the embouchure. It's all tongue. Yeah? So we are going to do it. We are going to do it. Um, we are going to play whole note, four quarters, eight eighths. Yeah? Breathe and going down. We are starting with a F, like in this range, if it is okay for everyone, and we're going half note down, okay? And just keep playing. But again, two things you need to think, airflow and tongue moving inside the mouth without moving outside, okay? Uh, yeah. Chromatically, chromatically, thank you.
Okay. Great, 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 great. Yeah, and so <clears throat> after a few months, my chewing was stopping and my articulation was no more clear and my flexibility was better. So I use it a lot. So we are going to uh, increase the speed of the rhythms. We're going to play a whole note, eights, sixteenths, and six tuplets. Six tuplets, right? Six tuplets. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's try. If it doesn't work, don't worry. It's just warm up. So eight, sixteen, six tuplets. Okay. Okay, I'm listening some trouble with the six tuplets. It's okay. It's too fast. It's too no. It's fine. I lose you a little bit on the six tuplets. Oh, uh, like uh, there are four quarter uh, measures, like you know, four quarters uh, a whole note, then a four quarter eight, four quarter sixteen, four quarter triplets. Sorry, my bad. Uh, I, I like to play exercises very long, as I, you can see. <laughs> so one more time, okay? From F. Now remember F and chromatically down. And so on, and you can combine it with so much rhythms you want. It is uh, for me, as, as I say, it is important for me that when we play in the outside muscles of the embouchure, doesn't we don't have a lot of movement. The same when we slur, when we do flexibility, yeah. Everything or most most of the of the of everything what we do should happens inside the mouth, yeah, not outside because. If we have a lot of movement here, then we have a lot of instability, and that don't help us. Yeah, the embouchure should be um, helping us and 
kind of giving us uh, independency from the from the instrument so that they work together and not against each other that is for me very important so uh, we have a few minutes left do you have any questions about whatever you want to ask yes so wait 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 So what exercises do you use to work on your lower range in rotor f tuba? Because it's a harder thing to like nail down for like centering the pitch. OK, thank you for the questions. I love this question because I hear it a lot. And it is kind of a thing with the f tuba. Everyone say, oh, tuba in the low range. Doesn't work, right? In my experience and in my personal opinion, that is a um, head thing. Because we all start, or mostly of us, start with a contrabass tuba when we are younger, right? Yeah? Our funion players, of course not, but I mean, tuba players mostly. Yeah? Here in the States, for example, you play in high school B flat, and then you buy a C, which is contrabass tuba to contrabass tuba. Yeah? So, and that gives us when we play a long time as young players in a contrabass tuba, the feeling that each tuba is going to be the same. But each tuba is different. Each tuba have a different, there are, is, there are different tools. The same with, the, if you are a tuba player and you are going to play euphonium, it's not going to feel the same, but with the euphonium for our head, it's easier because we think, oh, it's just another instrument. Okay, that makes sense. But when we change from the contrabass tuba to the F tuba or the, B, or the E flat tuba, then we, we try to search for the same feeling in the same range with another tool, which is not going to happen. Because the tuba is smaller, the pipe is smaller too. So um, to ask your questions, one of the main exercises I do with my studio and with my students it is what we have done today. Because that helps you to focus on the airflow and to learn how is the resistance of the instruments and the feeling in this range with this tool, if that makes sense. Yeah? Um, but I think what I can give you that I hope helps you in, in, in the next years is don't try to think or to f look for the same feeling in a bass tuba and a bass tuba than in a contra bass tuba because there are two different tools. And that was a game changing for me. Yeah, when I start, uh, I stopped struggling with the, with the range and I, I understood uh, I need to learn how I need to send the air into the instrument and how it's going to feel the resistance. And then you will be able to stabilize better the low range. Of course, all, that is a very personal thing for me that I also work with my student very hard is embouchure need to have a kind of, a, need to work properly. What I see a lot um, worldwide is like low, uh, or tuba players, mostly when they get into the low range, they release the corners. And that doesn't help, in my opinion, to get the stability you are looking for. So I know that we listen a lot, we need to have a relaxed sound and we um, connect this with releasing the corners. But uh, having a relaxed sound in the low range or in the high range or whatever, have nothing to do with releasing the corners because in the moment when we release the corners someone needs to do this work and the first thing what we do is, is we go against the monthies because it's the only thing that we can do and that's kind of work against us because intonation is bad sound is bad you know a lot of things get worse so if you want to uh, work efficiency in the low range in whatever tuba you play. It is important to work with the corners. And if you need more space, the space is not coming from opening here. The space is coming from opening here. You need to lower your tongue and open your show in the back 
knee in the front, because if you open too much here, it is also not going to work. Each node has a, an opening here in front, yeah? And if you have the feeling, oh, my low range is kind of, you know, bright, and it's not sound deep enough, then think behind. On the teeth, show down, and the tongue making space, and always with a big O, yeah? Here on the back, if hope that's help. So, something else? If not, oh, yeah. Come, come, come here. We make you famous today. What portion of time do you spend on fundamentals as compared to etudes and repertoire? Also a great question, thank you very much. As much as I can, because um, that is the only way we have to have a big control on the instrument, be independent of the technique, and uh, can focus on music. So basics is everything. Yeah, if you, one, one thing I, I understood a little late in my career was if you can control your basics as good as you can control everything else in the instrument, then you win. So you need to really focus on your basics and let's say, let's put time. Let's say you practice three hours a day. From the three hours a day, I would recommend you to practice basics two hours and one hour for the rest. If you were to put it, you know, in, a, in time, which sometimes helps better than say, oh, you need to do basic the whole day, yeah? Um, that is very important. I, I would say two thirds of your practice should be basic, but should be basic right and slow, and you, need, you should practice the basics so that you can play them as well as you can. And here, a uh, little key for all of you, we don't like to practice things that we cannot play, but that is the only way. If we don't sit down and practice, for example, I have traveling with double tonguing. Ah, at some point it's going to work. No, it's going never to work if you don't sit down and work on double tonguing slow first and develop the skill. Yeah, that is important. If you want to. Everyone wants to, you know, develop very fast and play fast, loud, and high, yeah? But if you want to do that, you need to work smart and practice slow what you cannot play. And then you are going to develop extremely fast. I, I guarantee you that, yeah? And that is very important. That is, I think I understood kind of late in my career, but it is important to do. Okay. So, thank you very much for uh, coming uh, so soon today, so early today. Uh, very happy to be here and to work with all of you. If you have uh, more questions, you can come and ask them, but the program needs to go forward. Uh, thank you very much. Enjoy the day, and uh, it was great to be here.
morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the nine o'clock recital today. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things to, to talk about re really quick. If you haven't got a ticket for the workshop, um, uh, you can please go to our website and uh, go ahead and, and uh, get a ticket. That's where our, that's our way of, of registering and, and tracking uh, attendance, and it helps us keep this go thing going for the future. Um, also, any pictures or social media things, you can go to Instagram and, and tag us at, uh, at US Army Band. Um, also, exhibits open at 10 today, uh, 10 to 5.30, and uh, I'm going to be saying this all day, there's a reception after the grand concert tonight at the community center where the exhibits are right now. We'll clear out exhibits, we'll have the reception in there, uh, and, and the USO is, is providing food for that, which is we're very grateful for, but it's a, should, it should be a good time. Um, our next performer is uh, from Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Gretchen Renshaw James. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the U.S. Army Band for hosting this workshop and for the invitation to be here. My name is Gretchen Renshaw James, and I am joined by Ina Blevins this morning on piano. I just wanted to say a few words about this program before I get started. I am a music professor at Hendricks College, which is a small liberal arts school in central Arkansas. And over the last three years, I've been really fortunate to hold something called an Odyssey Professorship, which is essentially a major grant, and it has supported a project of mine called Diverse Voices in music. And so the central effort in this project has been to work on diverse and inclusive programming and commissioning in the wind band and tuba worlds over the last few years. And today's program is a direct result of that. So we have a set of pieces, three of which are commissions from this professorship, all written by composers from a variety of backgrounds and identities, and we'll have a chance to get to know their unique perspectives and stories this morning. So I'll encourage you to follow along in the printed program if you're here at Fort Myer this morning for the program notes so you can get an idea of what this music is all about. Thanks again so much for being here, and I hope you enjoy. Thank <laughs> you. 
our next performer is a DTV buddy professor at the University of Kentucky. Uh, I've known him for a lot of years. We're very excited that he's here. Uh, please welcome Matt Hightower. Thank 
Is this the microphone I talked to? Yes, that sounds right. Good morning, my name is Matt Hightower. I'm the Tuba Euphonia Professor at the University of Kentucky. Thank you for coming out this morning. And a very special thank you to everybody involved in putting this together. It's such a great opportunity to be back. Um, thank you for your service. This is always just really well organized. A lot of fun to be here, a lot of great friends. Um, and it's great to be back. And also a special thank you to um, our pianist this morning. Uh, if you're not aware, she was in on very, very short notice. That was a really, really hard piece of music called Fantasia by Daniel Markovich. Um, she did a fantastic job in about a day and a half notice on that. Um, the next two pieces are for tuba and fixed media. The first one is entitled Monolith. It's a piece that I composed in uh, the very, very end of 2020. Uh, if you remember, there was a few things going on that year, uh, one of which um, were at the end of the year, there were these monoliths appearing across the world. Uh, a friend of mine, Kyle Millsap, who is the trumpet professor at Texas A&M University Kingsville, commissioned me to write a piece for trumpet and fixed media, and this is the result of that collaboration. Uh, the piece after that is written by Danny Howard. Danielle is a up-and-coming composer in uh, Great Britain. Uh, her piece is entitled Momentums, fantastic new work, involves a lot of valve clicking and air through the instrument that doesn't always come out super great on a rotary F tuba. Um, but it's just a wonderful work, and we're going to conclude this morning with a piece I composed called Iberian Vignettes. Um, we're going to uh, cut the third movement of that this morning for time. Thank you again for coming out. Hope you enjoy Monolith. Thank <laughs> you. 
staff, uh, sorry, first class Jeremy McBride. Uh, welcome, uh, I want to welcome you to Saturday's uh, 10 o'clock uh, TEW show. Um, up next, uh, we're very fortunate to have a group all the way from Florida. Uh, I, uh, I've known their, their director uh, for a long time. He's a great friend of mine. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to go down uh, and participate in some of their uh, regional uh, conferences, and it, it's a great opportunity to be able to repay them and have them up as a guest uh, at, at this workshop. Uh, a couple, uh, but before we get started, a couple of quick uh, notes. Uh, I, I'm going to be saying it all day. We've got a, uh, a reception uh, tonight after the grand concert. Everyone is welcome. There's going to be some free food there, so show up. It'll be a good time. Uh, please uh, register on the website. If you haven't done that, you can do that by by clicking get a ticket and that's our way of registering for the week and it helps us track numbers. And uh, all the programs are online. Uh, the Q QR code is, is up there. Uh, and just click around, you'll find the programs. Uh, but at this time, I'd like to welcome uh, the uh, Florida State, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Florida State University uh, to be funny ensemble con conducted by Dr. Justin Benavides.
Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is the Florida State University Tuba Euphonium Octet. Our first piece was a com composition by the notable young composer Benjamin Horn. His Tango Divertido is probably best known in the Euphonium Quartet version that, of course, was premiered at the 2019 International Tuba and Euphonium Conference by the North Texas Euphonium Quartet. We enjoyed presenting this piece uh, today because of its really spirited use of the South American tango style, as you heard, and of course the many opportunities that it allows for our individual members to shine as, sho as soloists. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it as the opening selection for our program. The next piece that we have for you is not actually particularly well known in our part of the world. Uh, Hiro Senshu is of course the celebrated Japanese composer. He's best known for his works uh, for euphonium, including of course Walk in the Woods, As Wonderful Things Drift By, and A Tribute from the East. Uh, I first heard this piece as a young student uh, when I attended a tuba euphonium ensemble concert at the University of North Texas, uh, directed by Dr. Brian Bowman. That was over 20 years ago. I was about the age of a lot of the people that are on stage today. Uh, this is a really lovely piece. It's a piece for double quartet, uh, and it's in three movements. The first movement is a lively fugue, followed by a lyrical movement that features our first euphonium, Jonas Zimmerman, and concludes with a frolicking dance uh, in a, with quirky syn syncopation. So we really hope that you enjoy it. Thank you. 
We hope you enjoyed that, and if that was the first time that you've heard that piece, um, potentially uh, that might be a piece that you yourself can program uh, in the future. We really enjoyed that. The next piece on the program is Eric Whitaker's fam famous Lux Arumque. Uh, this is, of course, an arrangement. The original is for choir, for choral ensemble, and uh, the title of this translates to Gold Light or Golden Light. This was written in 2000. Uh, we like this piece because it contains sim melodic simplicity, but it has really effective use of suspensions, 
uh, neighbor tones, delayed consonants. Uh, like much of Eric Whitaker's music, this piece is softly played and very deeply harmonic and tuneful, and it has different balances that create, well, texture in the sound. We think it works really well with this instrumentation, and we're excited to share it with you. This is Eric Whitaker's Luke's Arumque.
We have one final piece on our program, uh, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank the United States Army Band and, of course, all the wonderful people that have been invested in this meaningful workshop for our discipline. Uh, we've heard it time and again all week, but it is incredibly rare to have such an educationally enriching event here with such world-class artists and world-class people that is held annually and, of course, runs so well. We are indebted to the men and women of the United States Army Band for their contributions. Thank you for all that you do to make this workshop possible. Our final piece today is Whirlwind by Kevin McKenzie. Whirlwind was written during the 2014 iTech conference at Indiana University. It was intended to be a fun piece that shows off the virtuosity and the range of the tuba quartet, and in our case, the tuba euphonium octet. This piece was dedicated to the Boreas tuba quartet as they were the group that inspired it. Uh, Worldwind was recorded in 2015 by a quartet from the University of Memphis where Kevin McKenzie was a student and where he is now the assistant director of bands. Worldwind was also the winner of the United States Army Band Chamber Music Composition competition in 2017. So we thought this would be just a perfect fitting piece to conclude our concert. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank <laughs> you. 
Good morning, everyone. I would like to introduce you to our next performer. Keith Packman has long been a friend of our workshop and has participated in mock auditions, joint choirs, and recitals alike. He recorded a spectacular recital for our 2022 workshop and recently released a tuba and euphonium quartet with Isomer Quartet. Keith also teaches at Texas Women's University and Collin College. Please welcome to the stage, Keith Packman. Are we good? Yes? Oh, there we go. Hi, uh, thank you so much for being out here this afternoon uh, for this recital. I really appreciate you all being here. Uh, for a while, we didn't think we were going to make it out. I don't know if you saw the weather in Texas this week. It was, it was really rough. So I uh, want to give a few thanks before we get started and kind of explain what this program is about. Uh, first off, thank you to the United States Army Band for hosting this fantastic workshop every single year. Uh, I do think it is one of the best uh, annual things that is going on in this community, uh, and I really, really enjoy coming here for, for many, many years. Uh, I also want to thank the people who are running the workshop here, uh, everyone that has been around uh, organizing things, running the mock auditions, running the recitals, making sure that everything goes smoothly, uh, specifically to those who helped reschedule this recital from Thursday morning. Uh, really, really do appreciate that. Uh, lastly, I want to thank uh, my pianist, Yi Ching Chin, who is a colleague of mine at Texas Women's University, who is actually transitioning out of that position because she moved here to Washington, D.C. So if you're looking for a pianist, I know a great one. So, um, unfortunately, the, the program that's listed in, uh, in your program that you have online is actually not what I'm performing today, and that's totally fine. It's a little bit of a surprise for you all then. Um, just, yeah, it's fine. It's a two-week conference. No. So, this recital uh, comes from a few ideas of mine. Back in my younger days, uh, if you can believe it or not, I used to be an amateur DJ. Um, oh, thank you. Maybe that person went to some of those parties. No. Um, <laughs> Um, but what I really liked about it, and the unique th part about being a musician who also is DJing, is that you have to keep the party going for several, several hours of nonstop music. You are constantly transitioning in and out of different kind of genres of music, different kind of vibes, kind of reading the crowd. Um, and yeah, if the music stops, then the party stops, and you can't do that. Uh, so there'd be times where I'm going, you know, three or five hours into the wee hours of the morning. So when it came time to try to put my musical life uh, into the classical side of things. Uh, I was interested in how we can restructure the format of a tuba recital. So this is a recital that I dubbed uh, Songs from the Second Movement, or How to DJ a Tuba Recital. Uh, so the way this works is I'm going to be playing six second movements for you all. It is the second movement of Michael Dougherty's uh, Reflections on the Mississippi, the second movement of the Hindemith, a sonata for bass tuba, the second movement of Anthony Plogue's Three Miniatures. The next one's kind of a bit of a cheat. It is Barbara York's Through the Tunnel. I don't know if you're aware of this piece. It's technically one movement, but it's very clearly in two distinct parts, so I'll be playing the second part of that. I'm going to James Grant's Concerto for Tuba, The Three Furies, The Second Fury. And then ending with Drew Bonner's Deep Dark Night. Drew's here in the audience today. Ending with the second movement. Oh, hello. We love Drew Bonner. Um, yes, and there is no downtime between these movements, uh, and maybe like a second or two, but it's just going to transition in and out of all of the pieces for basically 25 minutes nonstop. So don't feel the need to applaud between things, because like I said, we're just going to keep the party going. Um, so if I could ask for one more music stand, <laughs> uh, and then uh, I will get my music organized, and we will play through this ourselves. Again, thank you very much for being here today. Thanks again to the United States Army Band. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everyone. All right, everybody having fun? All right, great. So we're really excited to bring you this, this next group. Um, I'm going to make a few short workshop announcements. Uh, you've probably already heard this. Register on Eventbrite for the workshop so we can track attendance. It's been really awesome to see so many people here today. And this, these last few days, we really want more people to keep coming back next year. So please register. Uh, our program is online. So for every concert, check the QR code at usarmyband.com. The Instagram is at US Army Band, and it says tag us. So I don't know if it's a game or something, a hashtag. Uh, figure that out. And after the sound check is and photo is at 1600 today. That's 4 o'clock. And exhibits are still open um, until 530 today at the community center. Um, and for everyone, everyone, there is a reception tonight after the grand concert. There will be food. There will be a cash bar. Um, so please uh, join us for the reception after tonight's grand concert. OK, so everyone, I'm really excited to introduce our next group. Uh, they've, they've been wonderful. They've been playing in Baltimore for a long time. Please welcome to the stage the Baltimore Symphony Low Brass Section. Thank you. 
So my name's Aubrey Ford. Uh, it probably goes without saying that I'm the principal tuba player of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. With me are my colleagues, principal trombonist Aaron LeVere, our brand new second trombonist, but maybe not so new to the DC area, Jeremy Buckler, and our living legend bass trombonist, Mr. Randy Campora. So, we started off with the slow version of the Ride of the Valkyries, and part of the masterclass element of this is sort of explaining some of the things that you might have to be prepared for when you play this in an audition either by yourself or with a group of people um, on stage. Um, after we're done with the demonstration portion of this, we're going to have two of the finalists from the mock tube audition come up here and sit in and try to drive the, uh, the bus uh, along with the Ferrari of the trombones. That's not a great analogy, so. But just go with it. Anyway. So, the Ride of the Valkyries, we just did the slow version. And one thing that's interesting is that, you know, especially for tuba players, a lot of the times we sort of gravitate towards the slow version in auditions. And that's certainly something that I do because it allows us to play with a lot of clarity. It allows us to play every note, all the accents, show a good phrase, all that stuff. Now, for what we're gonna do next, we're gonna play it again. This time we're gonna do the fast version. This is something that you might actually encounter more often when you're playing it sort of as a standalone piece. Um, because there are a lot of conductors who are just going to get to this point in the uh, Ride of the Valkyries, the B major section, and they're just going to keep cooking. They are not going to slow down for you. Now, in the opera, they might slow down a little bit more because the Valkyries are singing, and it sort of leads to this very climactic moment. But um, on stage in the orchestra, when you're just doing this as a standalone piece, it can really you know, start tearing. So here's that. So, Ride of the Valkyries, slow version, fast version. The lesson there being that when you are preparing for an audition that you know is going to involve section playing, it's a good idea to have the tempi on either side of that be prepared. Next, we have Symphonic Metamorphosis. And this is one of my favorite excerpts to play because uh, there's so many little intricate details. There's lots of really interesting voicing that's changing all the time. Um, there's a lot of really interesting balance challenges, um, and it's frankly really interesting music. Um, so we've prepared three excerpts from Symphonic Metamorphosis. Um, I'll do a little less talking, and we'll do a little bit more, more playing here. 
Um, the first excerpt is the sort of dance from the Turandot, the second movement, and then we have the metamorphosis into the jazzy section in the Turandot. And then we'll finish with the march at the end of the finale. Now what's really interesting about this and what may be a little bit more of a rare opportunity for you tuba players is that we're actually gonna have the trombones play a little bit more of what they play alone before the tuba joins in. So hopefully this will give you a little bit more idea of the context live that you might not otherwise hear. Thank you. 
All right, so next we have Mahler's Fifth Symphony. We're just doing one short excerpt from this, from the scherzo, the one that most of you tuba players probably know. And what's, as you may know, one of the challenges about this, playing it as a section, is really just lining up the articulation so that it sounds like one giant instrument. And aside from that, one of the things that can be a pitfall of this is when you start to play it too heavy right, when we start to really try to blast away in the low register of the instrument. So in this case, what we're trying to do is we're trying to really keep it together, and we're really trying to keep it light. Of course, you usually don't hear applause after playing an excerpt, so it's, it's a new experience for all of you, and it's a new experience for us. <laughs> um, but thank you. Uh, so next we have Bruckner's Seventh Symphony. And the reason I wanted to put this into our class is because it's one of those pieces that I think people really tend to think of it one of two ways. One is sort of the very kind of heavy and almost you know, like you're playing movie music, kind of, you know, hard, brassy playing. And then the other is the more sort of Germanic, you know, very flowing, very easy, very um, melodic sort of playing that, for me at least, I'm not necessarily saying that one way is right or wrong, although, you know, you can probably tell by the way I'm talking about it that I think the latter is more preferable, that, you know, being able to really turn Bruckner into a really long, beautiful melody um, and bringing out how the sequences that he writes contribute to the overall arc of um, not only just a section, phrases, but really an entire movement is something that I think, you know, young players especially often sort of overlook. So here we're going to do a little bit of that in the famous excerpt in the um, fourth movement from P to letter S. And uh, it, uh, it will hopefully show that we're putting style and phrasing above all else. And to that point, you can probably hear on that very last phrase how I got just a little too aggressive getting into the very last note. And 
you know, it, uh, it came back and bit me. So there you go. It's really important to, in Bruckner, to really make sure that you stay centered and focused on really singing and keeping the melody your main focus as you play. Okay, finally, we have the Fountains of Rome. Um, I think it's probably self-explanatory why this is on uh, this masterclass. We really just kind of want to play it because it's a lot of fun, <laughs> um, especially for Randy and me. But uh, you know, these guys get to have some fun with it too. And we'll actually do a little bit more of an extended version going towards the end of where the uh, entire low brass play. I usually shout stuff from the stage, so if I'm standing there awkwardly and you're all like staring at me, that's that's why I, we want to make sure that everybody who's tuning in on, on the live stream, hi everyone on the live stream, can actually uh, be able to hear me talk. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to invite a couple of the uh, finalists from the uh, mock audition to come up. Um, which one of you guys wants to go first? All right, great. And while he's coming up, uh, if anybody has any questions, we are happy to answer them. And if you don't have questions now, we'll definitely take them at the end of the class. Yes? As far as the, uh, the, the fountains that yeah. you guys played, um, I know that there's, like, it's kind of awkwardly scored as far as the tuba part is concerned for that uh, jump right from the bottom of the first page to the second page. Um, and the bass trombone carries down, the tuba jumps up and then joins them. Yeah. Like, do you have a preference, like, if you're uh, for yourself or for the students of yours, that, to, like, match the bass trombone is doing or play exactly what's on the page? Uh, I play exactly what's on the page. Um, you know, I think Respighi sort of wrote it that way because it, it just kind of works. Um, I, you know, I've actually never tried to play all the 16th notes, so, you know, maybe someday I can give it a shot, but... You know, for me, generally, it's just kind of worked out. Um, so, you know, that's, that's my very biased opinion <laughs> on it. I guess what I would add to that is that there's probably no right or wrong way to do it. I think probably when you're playing an audition, you really have to make sure you play what's written. But, you know, when you're, when you're in an orchestra and you want to kind of mess with it, you know, do, do what works best for you, but also what works best for your colleagues sitting next to you. Um, as long as everybody's copacetic on whatever you decide, then, you know, um, I don't think anybody would object to that. I don't think Respighi would object to that. So, 
Great question, though. Thank you for that. Okay. So, John. Yep. This, this is John. He was a finalist for the uh, mock uh, tuba band uh, audition that just happened. And uh, we're going to go ahead and have some fun, have him sit in with our awesome trombone section here. So, what would you like to start with? You want to play the ride? Sure. Okay, great. We're going to start with the ride. I just realized I can remove this. <laughs> I am, after all, a tuba player, so. Great, very nice. So, um, my first thought would be that it seems like you're really just focusing on just trying to play the notes, right? And when you're playing with a section, what you really want to do is focus on how you fit in as a tuba player, right? So, to the extent that you can, I want you to really focus on getting a nice sort of almost subwoofery quality, right? Really try to get that pillow happening. And don't worry so much about the articulations right now, okay? You're not playing this solo in an audition. You're playing it with these guys, right? Any of you guys have any thoughts? I'm gonna pass you the mic if so. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, even from down here, uh, what Aubrey was saying is, is correct. Uh, I'm sort of missing that, that lower part of the, the pyramid to really kind of set our sound on. And like you said, don't worry about the articulation. We're spitting and all over the place over here. So we'll, we've got you covered on that. Uh, so just give us that. And um, as the tempo keeps going, uh, consider how you're taking in your breaths because every time uh, there's a pickup note, you tend to be a little on the backside and we're, we're shifting back to catch you to move into the next thing. So again, if you're driving forward with the, with the tempo and the breathing and so forth, that'll certainly help us out. All right, let's have another whack at it. Yeah, to me, that's a big improvement. Um, I think now that you've got more of that sort of, you know, um, warmer, darker, richer, wider sound, I could actually use a little bit more of that. So, you know, try to make sure that you're doing it with your air and not so much with your tongue. Really make sure that you're, you know, supporting and blowing through as much freely blown air into the tuba as you possibly can. Um, and one other thing uh, before I hand the mic off is that I don't know if you can hear this, but you really want to try to listen more to your right when you're playing to match the articulations that are happening. Not the same you know, style of articulation, but the same time of articulation, right? Make sure that you're really you know, trying to fit in there 
as well. Actually, I'm going to ask one more time, uh, just the first number of bars, the first part of the phrase. This time, belt it. Give us the beans. To the point of, if it starts to sound a little funky, it sounds funky, but I want you to feel what it feels like to really fill out the bottom of that sound. Allow, your, uh, allow yourself to miss notes, allow yourself to, to have some funky sound, maybe, but really give it a shot. One more time, I'm going to have you do that exact same thing, but no tongue. You guys keep, you guys keep doing whatever the hell you want, but <laughs> but no tongue for you, John. There's that sound. There's that sound, right? When it's being done with air and not just with tension or with you know, the over-reliance on the tongue. There's that sound, right? I mean, you can really blast it out with the tongue, but the point is, is that it has to, the foundation for your sound has to start with the air, okay? And you know, I think that was pretty effectively demonstrated just now, okay? Good. Uh, should we move on? Fountains? Let's do fountains. <laughs> All right, so a little whispering in the ear here. All right, saddle up. How did that make you feel, Randy? <laughs> Very fountainy, of course. <laughs> nice job, John. One thing I can share with you is what we, we work on with our bass trombone students um, in the studio is to kind of, by studying the score and your recordings and your part and gleaning everything you can from those three sources, um, you'll see some architectural things and some things that Respighi is allowing you to do, giving you space to do, and some things he's not giving you space to do. So the first thing is, don't expend too many calories in those first 12 bars, because it's a lot of work, and you're just setting the seam. We're just walking up to the fountain. We haven't really got to the fountain yet, right? So don't go, and you didn't, but just don't, just chill out a little bit on that for both of us, right? And then, at number 12, the bass trombone and tuba has, a, has have three repeating patterns. 
We have a tune coming up from the bottom of the fountain. Pa team tom ta dum team tom tom team. And that's where we really come forward. And if you look in the score and listen to recordings, you'll see Respighi gives us space to walk into so the audience will hear that rising up from the bottom. And then at the fourth bar in every one of those three repeating phrases is what I call a flourish or a fanfare. It's the hard part. And every time that's the fourth bar. He doesn't give us space. Everybody's playing there. So if we try to belt those out, we'll get behind, we'll lose um, uh, clarity in the articulation. So we pull back just a little bit there just so you can do that, right? And then the next section, tom tim ta dum ti. Again, we're back to melody, right? And he's giving us space to go through there. And we can be heard by the audience. And then after that, it's mostly just a question question of section playing after that. But it, I find that this excerpt becomes a lot less scary if you have those signposts and you know your architecture and what you're, when you're really projecting forward and when you don't have to. All right, so let's see what happens when we incorporate that. Honestly, don't have a lot to add to that. That's that's pretty much night and day, you know, from the first to the second. Oh sure. So thank you so much, John. Thank you so much for sitting in. It's great to hear you. All right, next player, come on up. And as, as we're doing the change over here, I wanted to uh, make a comment. Uh, uh, Randy was talking about his students. Uh, I also noticed that uh, when I teach over at UMD, the students all have kind of a concept of p practicing in smaller rooms. We all have that, that problem. We can't find spaces to do our rehearsals and practices in. And for something like that, it starts to show. Uh, you come in and you're used to practicing to a small room and only having that as a maximum sound. Um, back when I was smaller, I was in the Detroit area and I had a, the opportunity to play quite a bit with the Detroit Symphony and um, uh, got to be very good friends with Randy Hawes, if anybody knows who that is. And one thing he would regularly say to me is, don't practice in practice rooms, go outside because how big is that space? And if you can fill that space, you're certainly gonna be able to take care of the business in this room. So if you have the opportunity as much as you possibly can, find the largest room that you possibly can and start trying to figure out how to, to fill that room efficiently, not forcibly, but efficiently. Um, I mean, uh, we as a section here, we have two massive halls that we get a chance to practice in and warm up in, so that's, that's a nice thing. And we all have practice rooms at home, which, you know, they're tiny, but we have that opportunity to play in the large rooms. So. That would be a huge recommendation I would have for everybody, euphonium, trombone, tuba, anything. Uh, maybe not chimbasso because you guys kill us anyway. Um, but get the opportunity to get out there and feel what it feels like to put efficient air through the instruments and fill up the space that you're in, especially large ones. That's, that would be one of my biggest uh, recommendations. I'm gonna make you talk at some point, Jeremy.
Okay, so we're going to start with the ride with Chris here. Everybody give Chris a round of applause right off the bat. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds great. A lot of sound. Um, one thing that is instantly noticeable about this room is what? What do you notice about this particular room that we're playing in right now? Um, I feel like it's, or I'm at least struggling to maybe get some of the clarity that I'm striving to get in the hall. Yeah, exactly. So I think one thing that can really help is to try, you know, to maybe take just two to five percent off the amount of effort that you're putting into the sound. The sound is very nice, and it really, you know, I walked to the back of the room back there, and you're coming out pretty good out there. So I think if you could just maybe take two, per, two percent off, you know, if you're putting your toe over the red line right now, just take it back so that it's on the red line, you know? And um, really, as you're playing, try to listen as much as possible, because it's pretty together up here, but then when I go out there, a lot of the articulations aren't syncing up as much as you might be led to believe they are up here, okay? Yes, one more comment. Or maybe several from everybody, I don't know. One thing that I'm also noticing back there, uh, one thing that we as a low brass section tend to struggle with is we are always called the late section. We're always late, we're always behind. And what I'm even getting from this distance from where you are is the pickups into each of those has just a little bit of uh, kind of behind the beat feel to it. Uh, we, we struggle with this all the time because we switch, you know, like I said, two different halls. Uh, if you, is, if we as a section can drive the bus and really keep that momentum moving forward, uh, including to the point of even feeling like you're maybe even ahead, it's crazy. If you're sitting in the orchestra that we do, we play before what we normally see as the downbeat or the ictus just to be on time with the, the strings up front. And so with that, it's, it's, a, it's a constant struggle that we always have. So in this, if you can keep that, th that, uh, that going for the pickups, that will certainly keep us propelling forward. Bravo, that's very nice. Um, I'm just gonna have you do one more thing here, which is that um, you and the bass trombone here, um, anybody know who Mike Sachs is? Anybody, raise a hand. Okay, good, 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 a, a few people, good. So Mike Sachs is the principal trumpet player in the Cleveland Orchestra, for those of you that don't know. And one day we were doing sectionals, I was an undergrad at CIM, and we were doing sectionals, and he called me and whichever bass trombone player there was playing the Iron Octave, right? 
you want to match your bass drum bonus as much as possible every single note, every single day for the rest of your life. <laughs> That's right. So, you know, I hear you listening up pretty good, but I don't really hear you really trying to match Randy as much as you possibly can. And I think that, um, are, is this cool if I just have the two of you play? Cool. Let's just see if we can really turn this into one giant machine instead of two instruments. One giant machine. Your job. So when I, <laughs> when I won my job in Baltimore, we had section playing around. And when I sat down, I thought to myself, all right, Randy is my god now. <laughs> and my, my entire raison d'etre while playing with these guys was to make sure that I did everything exactly the way that Randy was doing it. And if something was not the way that Randy was doing it, I would hear that and I would, like flicking a switch, instantly turn it off, okay? So that it was matching him, okay? So if you hear something that's not lining up, fix it immediately, okay? Here we go. So that's good. Make sure that you're not getting late to the same articulation, right? OK. We're not going to get too in-depth with this, but I just want to show you the demonstration of how important it is, even when we're all basically playing the same notes, that the tuba and the bass trombone really match up so that they sound like one giant instrument. OK, good. OK, great. So we're going to move on to, you want to do a little Bruckner? Sure. All right, great. So this will be Bruckner 7. And before you even start playing, I'm just going to remind you of what I said um, before we played, which is that the idea is to lighten up and focus on the phrasing and the melody, OK? So, who can tell me? What's the key to timing? Oh, I screwed it up. What's the key to comedy? <laughs> I actually made it funnier, maybe. <laughs> OK. So, there's a certain amount of sensing of timing that the rest of the low brass section is doing that I think you can get a little bit more on board with. OK? Really try to not just listen, but you know, anticipate everything so that 
you're really jumping in with everybody else whenever there's a rest or something, or when there's a long note coming off that long note. Really make sure that you're just really sort of getting this, I call this, you know, when I'm at work and we're all trying to, because, you know, I mean, this is happening up here and sometimes it's good, but it's usually not, you know. <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. And I won't say who's good and who's not because that'll actually get me in trouble. But, um, you know, we do have a lot of good conductors, but oftentimes it's not good. And so we don't know, you know, exactly where to put it. So, you know, what do you do? You look down the line, sometimes it's you know, important for somebody like Aaron to be giving a cue, right? But a lot of the times, it's just about breathing together and feeling it together. And when we do that successfully, that's when it really sounds like a unison section. And when we're not really in that sort of mode, that's when things start to get a little loosey-goosey. So I, I actually call that my alien brain, right? you're sort of really almost telepathically reaching out to everybody else. And obviously you're not literally doing this, but you're trying to just really get your feelers out there so that you can really feel every single you know, entrance and articulation. And so do that, and now I'm gonna make Jeremy talk. Yeah, sounds really great. Um, this is just some sort of general advice for any tuba player that's uh, you know, out there taking auditions or in school and studying and, and how do you, you hear a lot of Aubrey and everybody saying listen and match and how do you, how do, you do that and how do you teach that? It's hard, very hard to teach and very hard to um, develop that skill. You can develop it though and, and so here's some, some tips and tricks uh, that I found helpful for myself. Um, primarily is just listening to as much as you can. You know, uh, in score study, I for me, it was the listening more than the score study. I, I like to play along a lot with recordings, uh, especially when I was in school, uh, just to help learn the rep and learn different ways different orchestras played it, uh, to kind of have that flexibility to play the ride a couple different ways. Or, you know, Bruckner, for example, with all the different articulation markings, what do those mean in different ensembles? Uh, and additionally, if, 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 you have the, if you have friends that also play doing this kind of work, uh, at, at wherever you're from. Sorry, I don't know. All right, so then at Florida State, if you've got a couple of trombone players down there that are also in this pursuit, like doing this kind of work, whether it's playing excerpts or playing quartets or trios or whatever you guys can get your hands on, um, you know, that kind of playing is, is what leads to this kind of playing. I, I, I believe that firmly. And, um, you know, when you're doing that kind of work, you know, each, each sort of bring to the table what you're hearing and, and how it sounds to you and how you guys can sort of get on the same page about something. So um, that's sort of the listening aspect that uh, I think is so important. Um, and, and then, you know, that leads to someday you get a phone call and say, hey, can you be here, our, our, our wind ensemble or this orchestra needs a tuba player right now. And you come in to an unfamiliar situation, um, putting yourself through these sort of chamber music experiences, it's just a bigger chamber experience. So you'll be uh, better equipped uh, in that way. So, yeah. Yeah, well, let's. Okay, so Alien Brain, and this will be probably the last thing that we do playing. We want to give you guys a chance to do some questions before the, what is it, like a euphonium rodeo coming up or something? <laughs> <laughs> At one, and we definitely don't want you guys to miss that. So uh, Alien Brain, really lock in to where everybody else is. Thank 
And on that happy cadence, we're gonna end the playing portion of this masterclass. So, you know, I just wanna kind of riff on what Jeremy said before we open it up for a few questions, which is that how many of you students especially, raise your hand if you can name five violin soloists right now. Okay, you. Oh, not, not you, Jonah Zimmerman. <laughs> I, sorry, I pointed it at this guy, sorry. I know you can name five violin soloists. You're fine. Great, good job. That's not bad at all. All right. Okay, so yeah, a couple of you can. That's a really, really, really great start. Why do I say violin soloists? Why is that important for tuba players to know? You have to know your target. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's gonna be a sound shield there, inevitably. Um, but who knows the answer? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead, Cameron. Because you need to broaden your musicianship. You can't just listen to low breath all the time. You gotta yeah. expand. That, you need to broaden your musicianship. You can't just listen to low brass all the time. You need to expand. I think that's pretty much right on the money. Um, the one thing I would add is that generally in the classical music industry, and you know, I'll let you know if this changes, but right now that form of playing is held up as the epitome of our art. Unfortunately for all of us, it's not necessarily tuba playing, right? Most tuba soloists are not getting paid to, you know, $100,000 a weekend to go and play, <laughs> you know, three concerts with the New York Philharmonic, right? Yo-Yo Ma is, right? Vilda Fring is. Um, so, you know, that's a really, really important thing for you guys to start listening to now. Not tomorrow, not a week from now, not a month from now, not a year from now now. Okay, good. Uh, we'd love some questions, and if you have to go to the youth thing, please go and do, do that as well. All right. I'll get to you in a second, because I just heard from you. Yes, sir. Oh, hey, Dave. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Yeah. I mean, without trying to sound snide, the most obvious answer is subdividing, right? You know, really making sure, and for me, the most important thing when you're preparing an audition is making sure that you are subdividing after recording yourself. When you listen back and you're going, um, what would it be? Bum ba dum bum bee da dun dee dun da ka da dun da 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 ka da ka da 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 ka 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 da you know listening back to that and going da ka 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 da getting that sort of freight train sixteenth note subdivision going is uber important right because if you're doing it right that means that nobody on the committee will have a, anything to say about your rhythm. So I, there's more to say about that, but that's certainly the most important and simplistic answer. Chris, do we have time for one more question? Oh, we should go. <laughs> Thank you all so much. If you have other questions, come and find us. We'll, we'll be around for a little, while, uh, little while, excuse us.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our next performance will be our inter-service euphonium choir. Now, these euphonium players are some of the finest euphonium players in the world. That is not an exaggeration. We're very lucky to have so many service bands in town, and uh, I'm sure they will uh, not like that I said that. <laughs> uh, this will be conducted by Dr. Brian Bowman. So please welcome to the stage our inter-service euphonium choir. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. That was our first piece for today. It was the Rakatsi March from the Damnation of Faust. <coughs> Actually, the was known first as the Hungarian March and was the national anthem of Hungary. Uh, it was written by Nicholas Scholl in 1820, then integrated into the, uh, the Damnation of Faust of Hector Berlioz and also Franz Liszt's Hungarian Rhapsody. We're, for our next piece, we'd like to go backward in time to the 1600s, Samuel Scheidt, very famous early composer and play the canzone cornetto in B flat major. This particular arrangement was originally written for four cornets, but it works very well with four euphoniums parts. Thank you. David Holsinger is a prominent composer and arranger in the American music world. A number of his works have a religious theme as their basis. On a hymn so song of Philip Bliss is based on him, It Is Well With My Soul, written following the tragic loss at sea of the writer's family. 
It's arranged very specially for this type of ensemble by Pat Stuckmeyer, and it features uh, solo lines in all the parts. So we'd like to play for you now on a hymn song of Philip Bliss by David Holsinger as arranged by Pat Stuckmeyer.
The Dance of the Gestures from the Snow Maidens is a prime example of Tchaikovsky's keen sense of music nationalism. Originally composed as incidental music for the ballet, Snow Maidens, the dance forever captures the color and the zest of Roman folk dance. The ballet about the Snow Maiden, the daughter of Father Frost, tells of her forbidden love with a human who is already betrothed. The Snow Maiden follows him southward with plans to interrupt his wedding, but tragically melts under the rays of the sun. Dr. Travis Scott is currently director of bands at Lone Star College North Harris in Houston. Recently, he was the assistant professor of low brass and music theory at Xavier College, University of Louisiana in New Orleans. He has had similar posts at other universities and performed with the Dallas Wind Symphony, Lone Star Wind Orchestra, Keith Bryan's New Sousa Band, the River City Brass, and a member of the Blossom Festival Bands. He holds degrees from the University of Akron, the University of North Texas, and Michigan State. He has written many arrangements for the Conference Euphonium Choir, which we greatly appreciate, and we'd like to produce uh, the premiere performance of his uh, arrangement of uh, the Dance of the Gestures from the Snow Maiden, for, from Travis Scott.
I'd like to call to the podium uh, Sergeant Ray Irving, who has been in charge of organizing this group and getting them together, who will uh, introduce the members of the ensemble. As you can see, we're pretty uh, diverse with color up here with our uniform, so it's great that we have members from all across the branch. Um, technically not the Navy, but technically the Navy, because we have some Marine, a Marine guy up here, so that kind of works. Uh, <laughs> from our very own uh, United States Army Band Pershing Zone, we have Master Sergeant Dan Ord, Sergeant's First Class, Toby Furr, Chris Buckley, and Jeremy McBride, and myself, Staff Sergeant Irving Ray. From the Army Field Band, we have represented here Master Sergeant Lauren Urquhart and Staff Sergeant Patrick Nyron. Um, sorry, guys, I didn't know you guys were standing. I will take a little more time. Um, from the United States Air Force at uh, Bowling Air Force Band, we have Technical Sergeants Eric Lundquist and Allison Misserandino. From the United States Army Band, uh, President's Own, we have Gunnery Sergeant Hiram Diaz. Yep, it's all right. It's President Stone, United States Army M Marine Band. I'm sorry. There we go. I should stop while I'm ahead. Uh, from the 8th Army Band, stationed in Korea, we have Specialist Zachary Alradidi. Al I practiced that, and I still messed it up. Uh, from the Army School of Music, we have Staff Sergeant Brianna Williams. And finally, from the Air Force Band of the Golden West, we have Airman First Class Andrew Berry. Petite Litanies de Jesus is a beautiful and peaceful work. Harmonically, this piece features many seventh chords and parallel fourths, fifths, and octaves. And composers like Debussy and Debussy and Grovex were exploring beyond the major minor systems of the past 200 years. This arrangement has been done many times by a quartet from the United States Army Band, and we'd like to present that for you now in an arrangement by Patrick Schultz. Petite litanies de Jesus.
Our next work listed in the program is Fantasy for Euphonium McGuire, which is the original title, was written for this ensemble by uh, <clears throat> Benjamin Roundtree in 2011 for the premiere, which we did at this conference. And later he changed the, me the, the name to be Fantasy on Charge, all capital letters. And it's reflections on the composer's daughter having special needs. He says, my daughter Emily was nearing her fifth birthday at the time of this composition, and I found inspiration in the feelings and memories of being parents of a child with charge syndrome. The piece's four movements recall our journey through the joy of pregnancy, to the sudden diagnosis at birth, to the weeks spent in the hospital, and the assimilation of Emily into our family. God has been near to us throughout Emily's life, and our trust in his plan at times is the only way to cope with life's challenges. It is a joy to see Emily and her older sister enjoy life together, and my wife and I are blessed to have these beautiful daughters. This is in four movements. The first movement is called Beginnings, the opening fanfare, celebrating the joy of pregnancy and the sharing of the exciting news, and the journey to her birth. But as she was born, things began to unravel. It became clear that something was wrong as she struggled to breathe. We wrestled over the next days the thought of having a child with special needs. Movement two is called Struggle. The natal intensive care unit is an incredible place full of life-saving technology and machines making constant noises. I was struck by the contrast between the constant mechanical activity and the beautiful babies. The ostinato pattern represents the noise and activity of the intensive care unit and is overlaid with versions of the charge theme and whispers of a child's hymn, which many of you will recognize, reminding us through this piece that the God is walking us with every step of the way. Movement three is resolution. After six weeks in the artificial environment of the hospital, we finally welcomed Emily into the love and comfort of our home. The movement begins with a statement of the charge theme that moves into a major key for the first time. It's followed by the hymn that says, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The next comes an expression of thankfulness. It is a German table blessing sung as a round. Movement four flows directly from the third and depicts the fun and beauty of the two daughters playing together. The playful interaction between Euphonium 1 and 2 is typical of how girls play with each other. Frantic and joyful playing ensues. A wonderful composition written especially for this ensemble by Benjamin Roundtree. We would like to present now the Fantasy on Charge. Thank you. 
It's wonderful to have composers writing special pieces for this ensemble. We hope we hear more of them. Mansions of the Lord is a hymn. The words are written by Randall Wallace, and it was set to music by Nick Lenny Smith. Originally written for the 2002 movie, We Were Soldiers, the hymn served also for Ronald Reagan's funeral. It's about mothers and children losing their loved ones serving in war and in battle. We'd like to dedicate this performance of Mansions of the Lord to all those who have given their lives in the war in Ukraine. The lyrics are, to fallen soldiers, let us sing, where no rockets fly nor bullets wing. Our broken brothers, let us bring to the mansions of the Lord. No more bleeding, no more fight, no prayers pleading through the night. Just divine embrace eternal life in the mansions of the Lord. Where no mothers cry and no children reap, we will stand and guard though the angels sleep. All through the ages safely keep the mansions of the Lord.
It's appropriate that we use as our final piece of the program one of the pieces we played in the first time this ensemble got together at this conference. It's called Ball of Fire, and you'll know why when you hear it. Written by Peter Smalley. It uh, was uh, everyone who made this co concert possible. I'm so thankful for all of these musicians behind me, for their effort and for their work and for the wonderful things that they've done. I know that we had just two short rehearsals and they put this all together in a short time. I want to thank the administration of the Army Band, its commander, and all of us as we end this program. We're so thankful for you attending also Smalley's Ball of Fire. Thank you. 
here. We are ready to begin our next concert. I'm very excited to introduce the next group. Um, for those of you that are here, keep in mind that our exhibits are still open until 5.30 today. Check out our Instagram and check out um, the programs that are printed uh, at usarmyband.com. You can check out the QR code and view that on your mobile device. And I really want to see everyone here right now, tonight, at the reception after our grand concert because they are providing free food and drink and we really want to see as many people there as possible. I don't want to have to eat it all. I'll be in big trouble. Um, but I'm really excited to introduce our next group. I love the sound of brass band. I love the sound of this brass band. It's a really incredible college ensemble um, and they have some really exciting soloists here today. Uh, so please welcome to our stage the JMU Brass Band, directed by Dr. Kevin Stees.
Thank you so very much. I have to get this down at the right height. There we go. Thank you so very much. This is the James Madison University Brass Band. We are now in our 23rd year of existence. The band started in 2000 and have been going with a minor interruption just a couple of years ago, have been very active in performing, and it's a pleasure to be back here once again. We've played here before for this conference. Uh, workshop as well as for the trombone festival that occurs. We played a concert with Brett Baker, so that was great fun to do that. We opened with uh, When Thunder Calls by Paul Lovett Cooper. Paul was a former member of the Black Dyke Band as, and as composer and percussionist and wrote that for a gala concert that the band Black Dyke performed um, just a few years back. Uh, it's such a great pleasure to be here and to have wonderful soloists with us and particularly for the, the band members to be able to work with military musicians. Um, we don't always have that opportunity. Uh, oftentimes we might have some people coming to campus, but to get someone to be able to come down from DC, it's really a, quite a pleasure. So to be able to come up here and enjoy their musicianship is really quite a treat. So our first uh, solo work that we're going to have is one of Philip Sparks' older uh, pieces for euphonium. This was written uh, kind of uh, in the time period that he wrote a lot of his uh, really great classics for brass band, so written in the 70s, party piece. Um, uh, Spark is, is quite the prolific composer, particularly for brass band, and has such an ear for this type of ensemble utilizing the more unusual instruments that you'd find in a brass band, particularly in the horn and baritone sections. So to perform uh, with us party piece uh, this afternoon uh, from the United States Marine Band, please welcome euphonium soloist Master Sergeant Matt Summers. Thank you. 
so much for that. Um, I've been with the Marine Band now for 26 years and 28 years of tube euphonium workshops. So the past two years with, the, with COVID really missed it. Um, but I wanted to say thank you for just this, this family of low brass um, to Kevin for his marvelous sensitive touch with this ensemble. Um, just following and leading, and it's, it's been amazing. And I want to say a special thanks also um, to Neil Adams, who I believe is here right now, um, for taking a chance um, on a crazy idea that I had pitched to him back at Midwest in 2016, um, the end result of which will be available for everybody to play over at the exhibits starting at about uh, right after this concert. So I want to thank him for um, taking on and producing the marvelous five-valve non-compensating euphonium that I've been able to um, debut here tonight. Thank you so much. It's, it's so interesting in rehearsing with various musicians. When uh, we, we worked with uh, Matt at JMU, he came down to rehearse with us just this past week on Wednesday. Then we start talking about, oh, so you know so-and-so, and you were in the band. And so his time in the Marine Band, a former student of mine, Mark Thiel, also coincided with his time and just some other folks. So it's really great fun to see how, how uh, people's careers overlap so much. Um, now we're going to feature a soloist whom I just met for the first time um, and who our, our, our careers overlap in a way because he studied with folks that I knew and I'm colleagues with. And uh, he came down to JMU on Monday, this past Monday, and rehearsed with us and gave this incredibly wonderful master class. I sent him a message and I said, whenever your military career ends, I definitely think you should be looking at teaching at the university level because it was a, just a spectacular master class. And we're going to be performing the Capriccio by Rodney Newton, sort of a staple of the repertoire, particularly for those folks that know brass band repertoire. This was written for Jim Gourlay a number of years back and is, is just like with Party Piece is quite a wonderful concert number, sort of includes a little bit of everything, something technical, something beautiful, that sort of thing. So if you would welcome now to the stage to perform uh, Newton's Capriccio, this is musician first class Joseph Gamera. Oh, Thank <laughs> you. 
I didn't actually realize it until we were just about to start the piece that, uh, that if, you've, if you've seen the, the mini-series on HBO, so they had Band of Brothers and then um, there was a sequel series, 10-part series called The Pacific, and um, it just occurred to me um, as we got into the piece that it was so appropriate because we had uh, someone in the Navy and also in the Marines and, and that's basically what that series is about. And it's, I, I, ever since having seen that, that TV show, I was really struck by that tune, by that melody, that opening sequence, and thought it, it, it scores so well for brass band. So I'm glad that you enjoyed that. Uh, we have a, a euphonium concerto now for you, written by Andy Scott. And if you're not familiar with him, he's a, in, in the UK, very, very well-known uh, tenor saxophone player, jazz musician, and composer. Um, is very heavily involved in the saxophone scene in the UK. And he wrote this concerto uh, during his time in residence with the Foden's Band, if you're familiar with the Foden's Band at all, and he was sort of composer in, in association or in residence at that point, and there were a lot of pieces that he, he wrote for them, and one in particular was this concerto that he wrote for Glenn Williams, who at the time was the principal euphonium player of Foden's. He's now um, currently the principal euphonium of the Cory Band. And Andy being Andy, this piece, it sounds like what he would write. It, the middle movement is, 
ever so passionate. The outer movements are great fun um, with that jazz influence of his. And the scoring that he uses is so unique, and particularly for this type of ensemble that can get a little entrenched in, in maybe uh, uh, things being historically played a certain way. It brings a fresh sound to this type of ensemble and to the repertoire. Um, the only version I know of this is maybe there's a piano reduction and then of course with brass band, so I'm not sure that there's any other version of this out right now. Our soloist, um, is, it's extra special to have him with us because he studied with me during both of his master's and doctoral degrees at James Madison University, um, sat in the principal seat of this band for at least three years, and uh, is, I consider, just a really great friend of mine and certainly of my family's, and it's such a pleasure any time that we get to have him uh, visit us and, and head back to JMU and just to be able to hang out and make music together. So, to perform Andy Scott's Euphonium Concerto, please welcome my very good friend, Dr. Joel Collier. Thank <laughs> you. 
Andy Scott, check out his stuff. It's, it, he's got great solo works, uh, uh, and you probably heard uh, Alex Lappins do My Mountaintop earlier. That's another one of his pieces. Uh, it would be wrong to not include on a program with a brass band something from the Salvation Army tradition because um, those bands have been so formative in the sound of what we do, particularly in the United States. That's what kept brass bands alive in the U.S. for so, so many decades, quite honestly. And we're going to finish our program um, with a piece by Peter Graham. But before we play that, I want to thank all those involved um, with this workshop, particularly Chris Buckley, who had to keep hounding me to get him information. Sorry, Chris. Um, to, to have us back to perform again, I think that, that the brass band is a vital part of the culture for any tuba euphonium conference or workshop these days. There's so much liter literature that's specifically for soloists that's just with brass band. And considering the number of players of tuba and euphonium origin that actually play in a band, um, I think it's an important thing for us to really hold up and to try and promote throughout the country if we can, because there's so many more bands popping up, but I would like to see more of that, and particularly being a, a college professor, would love to see more of that at the university level, because it is a great outlet for just phenomenal literature and a way to make music in a new and different way. Um, so finally, uh, we're playing a piece by Peter Graham entitled Ad Optimum. And this piece was written um, on a, a visit that he had to the Star Lake Music Camp, which of course he would have attended, uh, been a guest at before. And he, he was really uh, moved by his visit, and he wrote this in response to some really fond memories that he had 
uh, of that event, of that camp. And it uses, as is typical in, in a lot of his pieces of this sort, it's sort of a, a three-part uh, piece, and it uses uh, tunes, the Laude, Laude Domine, it uses his tune, The Name of Jesus, which is an original that he wrote, which he also has uh, as a version just for solo with piano, and then finally concludes with the hymn tune, Richmond. So once again, thank you for having us, thank you for being such a great audience, and enjoying the JMU Brass Band. We'll finish now with Ad Optimum.
take pride in what we do and, and know that we're just as much, if not more, musicians than they are so, and start acting the part. Because acting the part is, goes a huge, long way in where you end up in life, okay? The, the old saying, fake it till you make it, actually has a little bit of truth to it, okay? So I want you to start from now on really, really trying to act the part of a musician, not as a tuba player. Second thing, when you ask, can I play a few notes? This is, you don't know this probably, but this is a real big pet peeve of mine. So it, and you played right into it. So I'll go ahead and say it. <clears throat> My students, I always try to get them to start becoming so confident and secure with themselves, not only as a tuba player, but as a person, that they feel like they can play at any time without warming up. Okay, so will it always work? No, but the more you do it, the better you'll become. Because in life, as we were just talking about outside, you never know what circumstances you're walking into. You may not be allowed to do some warm-up notes, okay? You, you don't go to a bar to pick up chicks or dudes and, and uh, warm up like, oh, she's cute. And you're like, <clears throat> Tim, 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 I'm Tim. Nice to meet you. Hello, hello, hello. Hi. I'm Tim Busby. You don't do that. You know, you're, you're confident. You walk up and say, hello, I'm Tim. Nice to meet you. Okay? So you need to take that same philosophy, that same confidence, and apply it to your plan, whether you know the hall or not. And also, the other problem with that, you, I can't count how many people in an audition situation, you know, you have the screen there, you've heard 50, 60, 70 players by this point, and then next thing you know, somebody walks in and they start doodling to warm up or to... It's just nerves. That's all it is. Most of the time when people do that, they're trying to find the, the courage to because they're so worried about what's going to come out of the horn. So they do 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 gone. I mean, seriously, it can happen. You know, you fly all the way across the world and you, you know, you do a Jacob turn. Do 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 do. And the committee's like, they've already made their mind up because you can't even play a warm up properly. OK, so just be careful when you do things like that. Not that you messed up when you warmed up, but you did play more than three notes. Anywho, so now, Bruckner. Um, there's a lot to talk about, man, but we, we have very little time. So we're just, I'm gonna try my best to strategically get as much info with these three individuals today, and you're my first victim. So uh, first one is, okay, Bruckner Seven. The first thing you need to figure out is Besides being the best musician that the committee's going to hear that day, what are they looking for? Why did they ask this excerpt? Always knowing why we're doing something is one of the most important things. What are they looking for? Why are they asking this? What's your answer? Um, time. Good timing, yes. Here, that you know what the orchestra's doing, that's correct. Um, and then the, uh, the markings. The Very good. Yes, that you can follow a roadmap, pretty much, okay? So, now, as far as following, following the roadmap, we'll talk about line and music here in a second, but, but as far as following the roadmap, what is your first opening uh, tempo? What's your number? Okay, you think you got there? No, no, you're much lower. You're like 82, 83 at the beginning, then it fluctuated from there. You did get up to 90 at one point, but um, my opening tempo is 96. Okay, next, the next, um, show my glasses. so 96 at P, 88 at Q, 76 at R. All right, so do you know what these, these funny German words mean? Yeah, good. Good enough. Good enough. We, we don't have a lot of time. And then, um, and then the next one, what does that mean? More. Even more, right? Okay, so we're going to manipulate being, playing broad with not only playing longer and adding more weight to the sound, but we're going to manipulate by slowing down too. 
Okay, so that's why it's 96, 88, 76, or whatever your interpretations of that, that number, okay? So that's the first thing, but you played the whole thing the same tempo, which does not work, okay? You also played the same thing with almost all the same markings until you tried to uh, force feed me right before R. That's the only time you actually played some different uh, markings, okay? So make sure, oh, is that for him? Okay. So make sure, let's, let's start by, let's just play it again. That, that's, your opening, that's your open tempo, let's start there. Okay, stop, stop. Now, <clears throat> this breathing thing, dude, and I'm not gonna get into this whole, you know, breathing exercise and all that stuff. I don't, I'm not really into that anyways, but you know, the music, you know, as you said, you need to show you know the music. You need to know, you need to hear the colors around you and you need to feel that and then show that in, a, in an audition. When you breathe like, dum, that makes no sense because the breath has to be part of the music. The breath has to be part of the phrase. For the breath to be part of the phrase, the breath has to be rhythmically part of the piece of music. So do you really need four big, big breaths <laughs> to, to play this? No. Or do you want? No. <laughs> the latter. Yeah. yeah. You're creating excitement from the intake. Deem. Deem. So I've given them two beats already. They know it. They know my time. They know my tempo. They know my style just by the intake. Okay, not. Dee dum dum. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. set them at ease, man. Give them time. Give them tempo. Give them style before they even hear the first pitch. Okay, here we go. You get one beat, not four. Okay, good. That's better. Okay, now, next thing is, be careful that you don't come in on the B natural so much that then you have nowhere to go. Because you, can you just take the da-da away, go, dee da 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 with line. Yeah, but, but the F sharp is not enough. I'm sorry, the, the D is not up. D, dom, dom, dom. Do, do, do. Okay, so there's a line. Now just can you add the do, 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 do. Add the little note back in. Yeah, but you, you backed yeah, off backed just a smidge on the, on the yeah. yeah, do it again. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Now, from where you leave the B natural, the do -de, do -de, do -de. okay, it has to remain. Mm -hmm. You definitely can't get off the gas. So when you establish the B natural, everything else is here. Okay. Now, you're going to get this more explosiveness of, of tone and sound just because you're going up an octave. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to start pushing. Now, mm -hmm. next thing is this. Uh, da, de, de. These these two repeated notes need to be two down bows. It's not de, da da. It's de, da da. Okay, mm -hmm. you're creating weight, not da 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 da. Okay, two down bows, two nudo down bows from the beginning. <laughs> de, da. No, not da, da, but da, da. Okay. Okay, again. Da, da. Keep going. Don't overdo this one. Same thing. Da, da, da and one. Da, da. 
so much better. Um, now, on top of all that, you know, one of the hardest thing for a, a young musician, and I struggled with it too, uh, when I got serious about playing the tube and, and started practice a lot, um, you know, in an in a audition situation, a committee doesn't want to hire somebody green that has no experience. You know, they, that's the last thing. You don't want to, it's not a training orchestra, you know. So, how do we, as young players who don't, we, we don't have a job or we're not playing every weekend, bridge this gap of showing that we know all that stuff you said before, the music, the colors, the know what the orchestra's doing, know how to fit in, know where, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it's to play with recordings, okay? Mm -hmm. Listen, yes, listen a ton, a ton, a ton of, of music, but also find you a place wherever, your studio, your house, your, Wherever, it's up to you. And get the speakers out, not headphones, not headphones, speakers, okay, where you can hear and play along with all these great orchestras. I, man, when I got, yeah, when I got serious about playing tuba, I would do that for like three, at least three or four hours a day on top of all the other crap I was doing, okay? So, because you just need to know everything about it. So then when you step on stage in an audition, you set the committee's mind at ease, you know, like, especially Bruckner, man. Bruckner's a funny thing because if, depending on what excerpts they pick, and again, this goes back to knowing exactly why they're picking this part of the, the, the music, is sometimes he marks fortissimos, and you're not, you, if you played fortissimo, the, the conductor would be like, whoa, take it easy, you know? Some of these big chorales that he has fortissimo, and you'd never play it fortissimo. You know, you play like it in mezzo forte. Do, 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 do. You know, uh, so just knowing that and playing it with the orchestra and realizing, oh crap, wait, I'm not, that's, that fortissimo is a little bit mm -hmm. not appropriate at this time. Knowing all those things is so important, okay? Uh, I like the way you're playing it. Great sound, man. The, what, the way you played the last one is, is very good. Um, I think another little, you're not doing it so much, but a, a thing you want to be very careful with on any Bruckner, actually just any, th any, any time at all, is that you're not over-articulating everything, okay? So I think especially last, the last uh, 15, 20 years, <clears throat> this word clarity has become so overly used in the tuba world that I see this tendency of tuba players that play very, very, very tongue driven, you know, and because we have this word clarity in our head and right away people start thinking about tongue when, when they hear the word clarity and then you start just t -t 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 more articulation, more articulation. Is that clear? Is that clear? Can you hear the notes? You're, you know, I hear this all the time. But the, the, the clarity in the air is not there first. So if you're adding tongue without the air, then it's too much tongue. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, like the way I practice this, I practice this playing all breath articulations. <laughs> and get that really clear and, and everything nice and centered and focused. Then I just add a little bit of tongue. Okay? But you, you want to you get the clarity in the air first, then add tongue. Because if you're, you're working the opposite direction, it's going to be way too tongue heavy. And we want, we want, to, drive, we want to drive music with air, not, not tongue. Okay? So, uh, good job. I, my main advice for you, dude, is, is you got to listen more, uh, care for your intonation. This whole thing where you're sucking air for four beats before you play, you got to get, get, you know, this whole, yeah, you know, tuba players, oh, I'm a, pro, I'm a, I'm a tuba player, so I'm an expert on breathing. No, you're not. No, you're not. In fact, you, you probably know less than other people, you know? 
just, you know, yeah, we need a lot of air to play the horn, but to do anything that's not natural blows my mind, you know? I don't do breathing exercises because I can breathe. If I couldn't, I'd be dead, you know? So um, now I just want to make that as natural as possible. Now, it, I'm not saying that four in, four out, eight in, eight out, 16, all that stuff is not beneficial. But again, knowing why you're doing it. For me, when I do four in, four out, or eight ins, eight outs with my students or, or just by myself, that's for focusing. That's for finding my center as a human being. Um, I'm constantly reminding myself why I'm doing it. I'm trying to let the, the air coming in the body and the air going out of the body to relax me, to find that center in myself. Um, I never do these kind of things where, you know, again, you start doing breathing exercises around students and they, they all of a sudden become like, like they're in marching band. You know, it's like this real physical thing that we do and, and we want to take the physicality out of it. Okay, as much as possible. So if you're going to do these four ins and four outs and all this stuff, move, keep the body in flow, keep the body in motion. So there's no tendency for things to kind of start tightening up on you. Okay, I do tons of yoga. I, I like yoga when I'm doing um, centering exercises, you know, touching your toes, you know, anything you can you can do to get this this sensation of the body in unison with the air. Okay, and right away what you find is the mind will slow down, okay? And you can find, that those, you can find those answers that I was talking about earlier. Because you also need to be talking to yourself every day about what, you know, as I, I, tell, I say all the time, you know, when I first got serious about playing the tuba, I would practice like 12 hours a day. I did everything in a practice room. I, I had breakfast in a practice room. I had lunch in a practice room. Only time I'd leave the practice room is to go and use the toilet. And, you know, nowadays, and that was pretty idiotic of me because... I didn't know those answers of why. I just, I got the material from my, my teacher, God bless him, and, and uh, I would go and just smash this stuff out for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours a day, not having no rhyme or reason why I was doing it, okay? So it wasn't until I started to kind of talk to myself in a weird way, maybe, uh, and find, ask myself these questions that I started finding the answers. And what happened was I started getting a lot more done in a much shorter amount of time, which is really good for me considering my schedule started getting much more busy as I got better as a tuba player. So you're not going to have the luxury of being in college your whole life. One day you're going to have kids, you're going to have a job, whether it be in an orchestra, teaching, or McDonald's, that you're not going to have the amount of time that you have now to practice. So you're going to have to be extremely, extremely disciplined and extremely efficient with everything you do, okay? So you should be asking yourself, why am I doing long tones? Why am I, do why am I doing flow studies? What am I wanting to accomplish? Why am I doing this? Why am I playing Bradoni's down an octave? You know, don't just do it. Know why you're doing it is, is the most important thing, okay? Stop trying to find inspiration to go to the practice room. Find discipline to go to the practice room. These are different mindsets that you need to start figuring out now that's going to prolong you in this profession if you're really serious. Because trying to find inspiration, you're always depending on somebody else. Finding discipline is you're depending on yourself. And that's who we're going to be able to depend on our whole life, is us. Okay? So, you have any questions about all that? I mean, we can talk about mouthpiece buzz, and we can talk about all that stuff, but I think, I think you sound awesome. You know, uh, uh, th this dude here, man, like he wrote me like weeks ago and, and he's been so persistent. I told him the other day, thank you so much for being persistent because, uh, you know, that's, that's a sign that you're eager. That's a sign that you're hungry. And that's the other thing, you know, just, just soak up, soak up, eat it, eat it, grab it, you know, take it and run with it is what it takes also to succeed. Not just in tuba, but in life. You just, you just have to want it more than anybody else, you know. And if you do, and you work hard and you're disciplined, it's a no-brainer. You got it. Okay? Good. Thank you very much. <laughs> All righty. Next. You know, ner nerves is another big one, like being nervous. You know, that's, that's something else that I have found that 
it really helps to talk to yourself about this too, you know. I mean, you don't have to talk out loud. I'm not saying go start walking around the, your, your practice room and say, hey, uh, how are you doing, Tim? I'm doing okay. Yeah, not like that. I'm just saying that you need to, like, if you do get nervous when you're in front of people or when you're performing, yeah, find you a mirror and look at yourself and say, why am I getting nervous? Because I'm worried that I'm going to miss a note. Why are you worried you're going to miss a note? Because I'm worried what they're going to think of me. Why, why am I worried what they think of me? And finally, you keep asking yourself, and you're like, actually, why am I worried about what they think of me? Like, nobody in this room right now is going to offer you a job if you play good or bad. Nobody. So to be 100% honest, it doesn't really matter what they think. Okay? When you're in a recital, they've already paid their money. They've come to hear you. So do you really care? There's a reason they're there. You know what I mean? So if you, if you talk to yourself, you start finding some of these answers, and, and actually maybe you do find an underlying problem of why you're nervous. But then, then you can deal with that. If you don't know, you can't deal with it, okay? So, you know, all these, all these type of things is little things that we need to, to get us to that next level, to get us to, because I know a lot of great players who you put them on stage in front of people and they just, they collapse, you know? And they're, they're two, well, most, there's two, re, there, well, there's a few reasons, but a lot of reasons is because they are worried at what people think of them. The other reason is a lot of people have, being a great musician is about having no secrets, okay? You have to show, it's almost like those dreams where you show up to school naked, you know, and, and you feel so uncomfortable, but there's nothing, you're not hiding anything. Here I am with all my faults and all my glories kind of attitude, you know? So can I do things better than some players? Yes. Are there other things that I can't do better than other players? Absolutely, you know? And being comfortable with that. Also, showing people that I am vulnerable, showing people that I am a little bit nuts, showing people that I do sometimes get really pissed off. You know, just all these Everything that makes me who I am, after I play, after I perform, whether in an audition, this is not just like recital solo stuff, I'm talking about audition or recitals. I want the committee to know exactly who they just heard play, that I'm an open book, all right? And that's really hard for people to be honest, first of all with themselves, and then to actually turn around and show a, a, uh, an audience who you really are is f scary. Okay, but that's what it that's what it's all about. That's what makes you special is that we're all different. So if you're trying to hide that, you're hiding what's special about yourself. Lots of times just letting go of that insecurity or that vulnerability helps us perform better. Okay, because it's actually okay if you make a mistake. I mean, it sucks. I mean, I made a few mistakes yesterday, whenever that was I played. Yeah, I was like, damn, I wish I had that first move of the bot back. I can play that a million times better. Of course. But on that day, at that time, in this exact period of my life, that was the best I could do, you know? And that's okay. All right, so tell everybody who you are. Hi, my name's Eli McAdams, uh, and I'll be playing the Bruce Euphonium Concerto from letter A to C.
Nice. Okay, so what I was just talking about of, of kind of driving the horn with the tongue instead of the air, that's what you're doing, you know, I mean, big time. So you need to, do you ever do, um, do you have a da daily routine? What type of things do you do? Here, take this, dude. I oh. think they want you to talk like this. Liz. Okay. Hello. Hello. Is it, is it on? Is that on? Hello. Hello. Yeah, oh, you. there we go. Cool. Uh, yeah. So I use the Vining's daily routine and the Vining's breathing book. Okay. So that's usually my daily process. Uh, I'm not 100% familiar with it. So can you tell me what's in it? Yeah. So it's mainly, it starts off with uh, long tones and mouthpiece work. Uh, then it goes into some lip slurs and uh, then some a little articulation stuff too as well. Okay. So a little bit of, a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, if I was you, I would spend a ton of time doing breath articulations. So when you're doing your long tones, I would take the tongue away. Mm -hmm. When you're doing flow studies, I would take the tongue away. Um, even uh, scale patterns, slow scale patterns, obviously, I would, I would take the tongue away. That you're trying to create tone with tongue. Right. I'm sorry, tone with air, not tone with tongue. Right, <laughs> right. Okay. It's very like, like that, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so, because what happens when you're, when you're articulating that hard, it's harder to make phrase. Right. Okay, because there's, it's, it becomes so percussive in a way, mm -hmm. all right? So, so right now when I hear you play, it's like, okay, nice sound. You're, you're very tense. I don't know if it's because you're a little bit nervous or what, but I'm like even tense. standing behind you and looking at your back, like you're just like, yeah. like this. So, and I think approaching just first and foremost, those long tones would just. Even, you know, don't even set a metronome, man. Like, don't, uh, don't paint yourself into a, a box to, that you have to be strict. Just really getting that sensation of. Oh, 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 where you feel that tone start with the air gotcha. instead of this ta, ta. Okay, and and build build your plan from there. That needs to be your new home base. Okay. Okay. Now, tension. I think just that will help you with with the tension. Even even if you just blow an air through the horn. And do you practice with a mirror? Uh, yeah, we have them in our practice room. Too. So you always have a mirror when you practice? Not all the time. Most of the time, yeah. Always. Okay. Find you a mirror, man, and just watch yourself, not only from the front, but, you know, watch yourself from the sides. At, at my house, at home, my studio, I have a big mirror here, a big mirror here, and a big mirror behind me. So I can always watch everything that's going on. Because the moment that those type of little things, and it could start from your toes, you don't know. Like, and that takes time to kind of find. But uh, it will all start creeping up on you. And next thing you know, you're just like this uh, ball of muscle. Right. And you don't want to muscle the horn. You want to you know, really drive it with the air. Um, now, next thing is vibrato. Mm -hmm. And I know you phony players love vibrato, but <laughs> vibrato should, should be used in a singing approach, yeah. okay? So, I mean, in Melbourne, you know, we get some really good solos, and, you know, you hear these amazing singers come through town, you know, and not many of them are going, ha, 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 ha. You know, it's not vibrato right. on every note. It's right. da, 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 something like that. It's just it's just a way to kind of add a little bit more spice to the sound. Not, I mean, I've been giving flute players a hard time this whole this whole week. But you know, how flute players, you ask them to play something without vibrato, and it's almost like you've asked them to, you know. Yeah. give me the meaning of life kind yeah. of thing. It's yeah. like they can't, just cannot turn it off. And euphoniums are pretty close. <laughs> a lot of euphonium players I know, they love vibrato. So I, also I think you should practice with no vibrato and then sing it mm -hmm. and find out naturally where the vibrato will, will help the music. Gotcha. Not that it's just on off, on off kind of thing, okay? So sing, I think singing and finding where it's supposed to go is, uh, is, is quite important. Because um, you don't want people to think, oh, nice vibrato. And then two minutes later, oh, still nice vibrato. <laughs> kind of thing, you know. So, um, okay, good. You got any questions about that? No, that, that helps a lot. Very good. All right, thank thank you. you. 
Um, so just a little bit on that topic, you know, again, <clears throat> as, as a musician, I think so many, so many times in our, in our development, we, we allow or we use our limitations as an excuse, okay? We build a phrase based on our limitations. I wish, and I try to tell my students uh, back home, if you're about to play an excerpt, you're about to play a solo, imagine what that would be like if you were the best, most blessed musician in the world. Like, let's just take a tuba player. Like if, you know, if God or whoever you believe in came down and touched you on the head and you could play as high, as low, as long, as loud, as soft, you name it, you had an unlimited amount of air in your body and you were just like the most musical person ever put on earth, what would that be like? You get that in your head first, and then you work backwards from perfection. Don't work forwards from our imperfections, okay? Imagine what it would sound like if you were perfect. Is there such a thing? No, of course not. Your perfect and my perfect would be different, two different perfects. But I'm talking about in your head, what would the perfect phrase playing the second movement of the Vaughn Williams be like if you were the most amazing thing? then work backwards from your limitations. Well, I got it in my head here, but I have to breathe here. But how do I shape the notes before and after the breath to stay as close to this perfection that I've already created in my head? That's how we should work. Don't say, okay, I'm gonna take a breath here. I can't quite get that note, so I'm gonna do this. This is the way most people build stuff, all right? Build it from perfection. Build everything from perfection. All right, dude, who, you at? who are you and what are you playing? Uh, I'm Sebastian. I'm from Florida State University. I'm a freshman. I'm playing Nocturno, the uh, Strauss solo, uh, arranged for tuba. Good. Take it away. Very nice plan, dude. Very, very beautiful. Um, so you have this little tendency. There's, there's a few little things that we can uh, address. All right. So first, and you have these tendencies to. I hear you want to create phrase. You want to hear create this well music, um, but then you get somewhere, and you either dictated by a marking on the page, which okay, I understand that, or you're dictated on how much air you have left in your body, okay? So you have all these little mini phrases throughout. But where are you going the big phrase, okay? So you hear the difference? Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a big picture there too. It, but there's all the little ones that you were doing too. But it can't just always be from zero, five, zero, zero, five, zero. Okay, because then you start making me feel seasick. And I don't actually get seasick. Um, never have. But anyways, but I feel a little bit like, ooh, yeah. Ooh, here we go again, yeah. But you're never like, you're taking me, you're taking me. You, and it's, it's not that you can't come down again. I'm not talking about the whole thing has to be like that, you know. But you have to kind of, you ne don't always go back to square one. The way you start, gorgeous, dude. It's just you never get there, all right? And I want you to get there and then maybe come away, if that's what you feel, you know. But I can hear what you're trying to do. But I think also a big thing that we do and you do too a lot of times is we get to these, these climaxes in a phrase, and then right away you get off the gas. It happens all the time, you know. But I think if you would stop, take the horn away, and sing. Oh, let's do that. Here, sing. Play your first pitch. <laughs> Play your, you want the first pitch or do you not? Know oh, you're going up there. Oh, shit, okay. Yeah, my, my voice is high. Dude, no, uh, get, on, get on up in here. Okay. <laughs> hey, what did we talk about earlier? Confidence. Yeah. Be proud of who you are and how you sing. Do, 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 do. Fantastic. Huh? How this, cool is that? This is the second time I have to sing in our master class. Yeah, well, you should do it more often. You're really good at it, actually. That's crazy, man. That's really good. I did not expect that, you know, so that's, that's good. Yeah, so find out what you want to do with it, singing it first, and, and record yourself singing it. We, you know, everybody talks about record yourself playing every day, record yourself playing every day. But you also need to record yourself breathing. You need to record yourself singing, you know, because you pick up the, the simple, to simplify playing a horn is the best way to fix the largest problems. All right? it's, you can't fix a lot of problems if you're sitting there, because it's playing the tuba, there's too many things to think about. You got valves, you got air, you got blah, 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 intonation, you got these slides that you're pulling around, all this crap. Take all that away, simplify it, fix that first, then start adding to it. Don't, don't just try to figure it out on the horn. Okay? The horn's easy to play if you have it here first. But right now, I, I think there's so many more musical opportunities that you could, you could uh, kind of fulfill, all right? So make sure you really, really push, especially in a piece like this, dude. I mean, come on, it's gorgeous, right? Speaking of that, who are you playing this for? What you got in your head? I never thought of that, actually. Oh, dude. How, how could you play this piece of music and not have someone in your mind or something? I don't know. Maybe you love just love ice cream <laughs> or something, you know, like a steak or brisket. Oh, baby. You know, well, something. Now, now I have something. Now, oh. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, yeah. So, uh, Something that really changed my life was when I started to apply motion, emotion, to music. I'm not talking about trying to play emotionally. I'm talking about finding something with myself, have that there, and then relate it to this, okay? Most people love their mama. That's always kind of the safeguard. I hope you do, because I'm about to use that as an example. You're like, gosh. Can't stand that woman. <laughs> no, but no, you know what I mean. Like, so, oh, I love mom. I love her. You know, and then you play it. You know, with with her with her image and the, all the love and joy you have from seeing her beautiful face, and then you play it. You know, or your girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever. You know, sorry, you get in trouble these days. You know, anybody, whoever you love. You know, 
Um, you know, six pack, when six pack was written for me, it was really hard for me to come out of my box and sh all that stuff I was saying earlier was I hadn't quite discovered being comfortable with who I was as all my little mistakes I had. So when James first wrote that piece six pack, he, we made up this story together about this guy going to the bar and all the steps you go through when you're having fun and partying and drinking a little bit too much and then feeling invincible at the end, blah, blah, blah. But what those, those six movements are actually about is me. It's six different personalities that I have, okay? Uh, melancholy is, is like the love I have for my family. That's all it's about. Um, discotheque is I love dancing. I love going to a dance club and tearing it up, you know? Invincible is sometimes I feel like I'm 10 feet tall and bulletproof. You know, it's, it's just different parts of me who I am. So it's very, that, that piece is very easy for me to connect to because it's so burned in my skull, you know? But all music needs to be that way. Every excerpt needs to be that way. It's the, the, the little story I tell all the time also about, you know, the uh, Prokofiev for Romeo and Juliet, the little do this little solo. And Gene Bacorny says on his CD, this is the last time that Romeo and Juliet will ever see each other alive again, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, wow, that's sad, but I don't know Romeo and Juliet. I know who they are. I know who they were, if they were. I know I've seen the, you know, the Shakespeare thing, and I've heard the music, and I've seen the movies, and read the books, and all that stuff, had to in high school. You know, I've done all that, but I don't know who they are. I can't relate to it. Yeah, it's a sad story, but if I put myself in that shoes and I had to go in, in, into my daughter's room and tell my 14-year-old daughter, baby, I love you so much, goodbye, and walk away, then I feel it. Then I take that emotion and I put it to that piece of music, and it becomes very different. It, it becomes personal, you know? And, and when I started doing that to every excerpt, when I started doing that to every piece of music, I started doing a lot better <laughs> for some reason, you know? And the reason is, I think, is because I'm connecting on a different level to the audience members or to the committee members. I'm connecting on an emotional level. And we all, if we can connect emotionally, we feel like we know each other better. So, and when you feel like you know someone, then you pull for them. All right, so even with a carpet or a screen between you, you know, you always hear, man, there's something about number 54, something really special about that person. I really like it. Did that number 54 really play better than everybody else? Maybe not, you know, or maybe they did. But I think it's something that they're doing, that they're showing something a little bit extra special, a little bit more personal, that all of a sudden you, you connect. Oh, wow. I feel, I feel what they feel. And when you feel what somebody feels, you can understand them and help them, okay? So it blows my mind that you haven't thought about this because you're a fantastic little tuba player and fantastic little singer too. But we need to find ways. We need to find ways to progress in life. We need to find ways to get to that next level in life, okay? And doing this soul searching is what's gonna get you there. And it's weird, isn't it? Because like, you don't wanna get emotional on stage, you know? You don't want to start crying in front of people. But nobody's going to make fun of you. If they do, they're a homeless cuss. Sorry. If, if they do, shame on them. Shame on them. Okay? You cry if you want to cry. It's totally okay, man. All right? But you got to cry. You can't play this without crying. And right now, you're just like, dee, 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 which is nothing wrong with that. It's not like it's bad. It's just but every, every other person in here is going to play it the same way. All right, find out what makes you special. Find out what makes you special. Okay, you got any questions? Sorry if that was a little bit too much on you. Like, you're sitting here like a deer in the headlights now. You're like, oh my God, this guy's scary. Can I play it again? You want to play it one more time? Absolutely, dude. Go for it.
Okay, so time's up. Uh, is there any quick questions at all? No? Okay, good. Yes, sir. Yeah, you take a picture. Just let me, <laughs> I'll try, I'll try to fin finish it up. So um, find out what makes you special. Highlight that. Don't worry about your imperfections. If you highlight what makes you special enough, no one will see the other, okay? I promise you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.
Good afternoon, everyone. That first piece was Fanfare for a Friend, composed by John Stevens for German tubist Dietrich Utkroff and a group he directed called the Berlin Tubists. Mr. Stevens was inspired by a moving and memorable speech about the unification of Germany that had just taken place in 1989. When he was later asked if he would compose something for the group, Mr. Stevens wrote, that, wrote this short work in a global spirit of global friendship. And I'd like to think that that sentiment applies to here as well, as we have on stage with us today the Armed Forces Tuba Euphonium Ensemble, which consists of active, reserve, and National Guard members of all of our different branches of service. On behalf of the commander of the United States Army Band, Pershing Zone, I am Master Sergeant Daniel Ord, and I want to thank each and every one of you for being here for the penultimate concert of our Tuba Euphonium Workshop. We hope that you've had a great and terrific week and that this performance and the grand concert later this evening will leave you satisfied and inspired to continue pursuing your musical endeavors. Our next piece is March Militar Francaise and is the finale movement of a four movement symphonic poem, Sweet Algerienne, that was inspired by Camille Saint-Saëns' trips to Algeria, then a French colony on the continent of Africa. This march has become famously independent of the other movements and is unmistakably French and is an unmistakably French finale that, that belies the composer's irrepressible patriotism. Nothing could be more lively, more rousing, in a word more French than the conclusion to an otherwise conventional work. Thank <laughs> you. 
So we always love to feature works by our military personnel. And the next piece is by a former euphonium player here at Pershing Zone, Master Sergeant retired, retired Neil Corwell. It's titled The Furies, and it is a programmatic work depicting mythical characters found in many of the cl classic Greek tragedies. These ominous creatures are scary boogers with bloodshot eyes, robes of red, and snake-like hair. This was written for and premiered by the in 1995 for Symphonia under the direction of R. Winston Morris. I hope you enjoy The Furies by Neil Corwell. Thank you. 
Well, now I'll give them a break from that. Whew. We will now play the remarkably beautiful closing number from Bernstein's operetta, Candide. It was arranged by our own Staff Sergeant Irving Ray in memory of Lieutenant Colonel Derek Shaw, a tubist and former deputy commander of Pershing Zone who sadly passed away in 2021. Many of you may have known him as I did, an absolutely fantastic conductor and leader who genuinely, genuinely cared for the music and more importantly, the people that served under him. Here is Make Our Garden Grow by Leonard Bernstein.
They always like a double cutoff. That's their favorite thing. The next piece was written by Rocco Di Giovanni, a graduate of the Juilliard School of Music and also served in the United States Army during World War II. We're going to pull out all the stops for this one for your enjoyment. Uh, so we're going to invite to the stage Master Sergeant Chad Leader, Sergeant First Class Eric C., and Staff Sergeant Peter Soroka to join us for this Roomba rendition of Glendora. Band of Brothers is a landmark 10-part miniseries based on Stephen Ambrose's bestseller and recounts the remarkable achievements of an elite team of U.S. paratroopers whose World War II exploits are, incredible, are as incredible as they are true. These were not 
These were only ordinary men swept up in the most extraordinary conflict in world history. And our next piece is dedicated to all those serving and who have served to protect our country and to defend freedom across the globe. Here is the title theme from Band of Brothers by Michael Kamen and arranged by Staff Sergeant Justice McKenzie. Well, what would a U.S. Army band concert be without a march? So, here you go. Everyone knows who John Philip Sousa is, but not everybody knows that he became a member of the ancient Arabic order of the nobles of the Mystic Shrine, that's a mouthful, in Washington in 1922. Shortly thereafter, he was named the first honorary director of the Almas Temple Shrine Band and composed a new march saluting the Shrine Organization. The next year, Sousa was called upon to lead a huge band of 6,200 Shriners in Griffin Stadium, Griffith Stadium, and incidentally was the largest band Sousa ever conducted. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, we don't have 6,200 tubas on stage today, but we still hope that you will, well, can you imagine that? Wow. <laughs> I, I'm no longer AFTI, do an AFTI, 6200. But we still hope that you like this rendition of Nobles of the Mystic Shrine. Thank you. 
I was, I just like making them stand up and sit down. It's fun, I don't know. Percussionist, wait! Sorry, I didn't introduce you earlier. How about that tambourine, everybody? That was great. I just wanted to say thank you so much to our percussionists, Staff Sergeant First Class, Jake Harpster, Staff Sergeant Tim Perry, Staff Sergeant Peter Soroka, Staff Sergeant, I almost got the rank wrong, sorry, Staff Sergeant Milky, Thank you. Forgot your first name. What was your first Jonathan. name? Jonathan Milky, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our percussionists who help us out. It's the Army. We just use last names. It's totally fine. Well, again, thank you all so much for coming out this afternoon. We have just one more piece for you. We hope that you stick around for our grand concert this evening, and then afterwards, attend our reception in the community center, where we uh, have a catered barbecue and beverage provided by the USO. So you don't even need to have dinner right after this. You can just grab a snack out of the vending machine or what have you, uh, come to the concert, and then run over to the, to the community center and eat barbecue, okay? So we're gonna end our program with a fun arrangement from a former Pershing Zone tubist, Jeff Arwood, who was one of the key figures in starting this workshop that still runs 40 years later. This hit tune was released by Billy Joel in 1984 on his album, An Innocent Man, and we hope you'll snap, sing, and doo-wop along as we play for the longest time. That's the tune. We're not just gonna play for the longest time. Thank you. 